Hello everyone and welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage of Falcon 2024 here at the Aria in Las Vegas. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, sitting alongside my co-host and co-analyst, co-founder of theCUBE, Dave Vellante. We've got a great guest for this next segment. I'd like to welcome back to theCUBE, DJ Goldsworthy. He is the VP and Global Practice Lead, Security Operations and Threat Management at Aflac. Thanks so much for, for coming on theCUBE. Yeah. Thanks for having me, it's great to be here. Good to see you. So, Aflac is a, is a household name. I think we're all familiar with that, with that quacking duck. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the company and, and what you do there? Yeah, sure. So, like you said, everyone knows the commercials. Uh, about 90 to 95% brand recognition. So, you know, we're a brand company. And, and what Aflac does is we are one of the largest uh, providers in the world of supplemental insurance. So, uh, we provide policies around accident, um, accident indemnification, hospital indemnification, cancer policies. So when, uh, when our customers fall on hard times, have an accident, have a critical illness, um, medical bills stack up, and then primary insurance doesn't always cover everything. So uh, we provide money quickly to them in their time of need. And that's what our, really what our insurance is all about. So they can focus on their care, they can focus on being with their family, and, uh, and so, that really makes for, for us technology very important because we have to be there when they, when they need us. Because um, they we're really selling a promise uh, and that promise is that we'll be there in their time of need. And so it's, uh, we do uh, about 20 billion a year and uh, a little known fact about Aflac is about 70 to 75% of our business is in Japan. So we are also a household name in Japan, uh, so that's 75% of your business is in, your, re, your revenue is in Japan? That's, that's correct, yeah. Wow, I mean, I would think, I was going to ask you about the macro trends, I would think it, it's really favorable to you as price of healthcare keeps going up and the, the, the services that you get keep going down. So, and, and a lot of people as they age, the, the boomers are getting to that point. Uh, I would think that the, the, the macro trends are really favorable for your business. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've experienced you know, you know, good growth um, and, and we've been diversifying the products. Uh, also have life insurance products in Japan, that's, that's really big. Um, so yeah, I mean, that overall the, the macro trends um, have been good, technology trends, you know, being able to reach more, more customers uh, in different segments has been, uh, been a big boost for business is, too. Is home care in scope of your um, it's It's not at services? this time. It is not at this time. I mean, obviously if, Part of the treatment involves home care. You know, the, the supplemental nature of the uh, of our insurance will, will help them financially. Right. Um, but it's not something that we actually extend. Could be a growth area for a growth vector for you. And so, from an adversary standpoint, what is it? Fraud? They 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 they're trying to commit fraud and impersonate people? Or there there is a fraud element. Um, I would say that that's that's probably not our largest threat. Um, what is? Uh, I would say it's, it's honestly commodity, commodity uh, cyber, cyber threats. So uh, you take your ransomware, mm -hmm. you know, your disruptive forms of, of malware, your extortion schemes. Um, so a lot of the stuff that would, would be you know, cross industry, cross vertical, um, you know, there's an exposure there. Also, you know, we're, we're very cognizant of our, our, of our brand, right? So because we're a brand company, we have to protect that brand because there's a lot of trust and, and, uh, and faith in that brand. And so we have to make sure that adversaries aren't trying to use that brand uh, to promote you know, and further their, their attacks. So things like you know, phishing schemes and, and other schemes, uh, employment fraud schemes, uh, things like that. Uh, because it's a household brand, it you know, puts us in, into the, uh, the scope of some of those types of, of you know, adversarial activities. So when you think about AI and the, and the potential for adversaries to abuse AI, generative AI, mm -hmm. to, to, to become even more threatening to these organizations, how, how what are, what are, when you're thinking about how it, the AI in its, in its, I just want to hear, <laughs> sorry, I'm not making sense here, but I want to hear about how AI is changing the threat landscape. No, I, 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 <laughs> I, I'm, I'm picking up what you're putting down there. Exactly. I mean, it's going to make attacks um, faster, right? So, so speed is always a challenge in cyber because um, the faster that adversaries can exploit vulnerabilities, the faster you have to be at fixing them, identifying them and fixing them. Um, they're also going to become more sophisticated because they're going to be able to gather large amounts of information on our identities, you know, social media, um, information about the company, 
Um, and and, and it, all these attacks start to become very like natural feeling. They know the language of the company, the, the, the culture of the company, and can use that in attacks to socially engineer. So that just means that we have to match their AI with our own AI. You know, so, so be able to detect at the speed that they're attacking and be able to disrupt at the speed that they're attacking. And so that really means we have to layer in uh, security at a, at a much deeper level than before and be able to move across the spectrum of attacks much faster. I'm interested too in what you were talking about, how trust is such an important part of your business because yeah. these are really important Life, life topics that you are helping people with. As you said, you're, you're there in people's moment of need. And AI is abusing people's trust, mm -hmm. and, and as you said too, it knows the language. It knows how to social engineer and, mm -hmm. and tug at people's heartstrings too. How much of what you're doing is also educating customers in terms of, 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 of being aware of these threats? Yeah, I mean certainly there's, there's a lot of outreach with customers, and not just customers, but you know, we have, uh, many thousands of uh, producers, so what we call producers, which is uh, agents and, uh, and, and brokerage uh, companies that are out selling our policies. And, and it's very, very same thing with them. You know, we have to extend that awareness you know, to our producers, to our customers, so that they know, you know how to report things to us if they have something, see something that is suspicious, uh, how we will and how we will not engage with them so that if they see something that's out of the norm, they would, they would know, like that's not, that's not how Affleck you know, interfaces with us. They can know to, to maybe try to avoid that, but then also have you know, outreach when we know something's happening, um, to have the means to, to reach a large you know, range of people to let them know we're seeing this type of activity, be aware um, so that we can stay out ahead of those types of threats. It's all, all interrelated. And, and DJ, this morning you and I were talking and you, you're basically all in on CrowdStrike. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask you something. At, ahead of RSA this year, we did a survey with our partner ETR and we asked, um, I, I forget what the N was, I think it was like a little over 300. So it wasn't huge, but it was substantial. Over the next 12 months, do you expect to increase or decrease the number of cybersecurity vendors in your stack Certainly consolidation is a big theme. I would have expected a higher number than this. Only 9% say they were able to decrease. Now, just because you're all in on CrowdStrike doesn't necessarily mean you're able to decrease the number of vendors in your stack, but presumably that's part of the, the objective, is to simplify mm -hmm. uh, so that you're not, you, know, you don't have all the vendor sprawl. Yeah. I wonder if you could sort of give us a lay of the land as to how you are, um, what your, paint a picture, if you will, of your environment. Is it, like everybody else, huge vendor sprawl? Given that you're all in on CrowdStrike, have yeah. you been able to consolidate some of the, that sprawl? Take us through that. Yeah, yeah, so, I mean, yeah, I, I would say our, our tech stack probably looks a lot like an enterprise, you know, of our size. Uh, other enterprises of our size, our peers. Um, we're hybrid, we're in cloud, you know, so we're, we're modernizing our technology stack. Um, we have digital initiatives you know, to support the lines of business. Um, so we're seeing that change all the time. Our, our architectures are changing. Uh, we're leveraging new technology. So that, that evolution probably gives way to some of what you're, you're referencing when other customers say, uh, maybe, maybe we haven't been able to consolidate as much because as you enter all these new technology domains, um, that creates new needs. And, and sometimes there's boutique products that are needed to close some, some gaps, but for us, uh, going all in uh, with CrowdStrike has allowed us to consolidate our vendors you know, pretty, pretty substantially. Um, I think we're probably down from ab about three years ago between some of our strategic partnerships, CrowdStrike at the, at the forefront of that, uh, down about 15 technologies. And that's having added some others, right? So, right. so we're adding as we're so removing. Net, net, net you're down. Yeah, net we're down. Mm -hmm. And um, I, it's certainly a trend we want to continue. I think, uh, I hear often at conferences like this, and just when I'm out with peers, they say, uh, well, we don't want to put all of our eggs in one basket. You know, there's a lot of risk with that. And my rebuttal to that is always, well, there's risk with not putting your eggs into you know, a few baskets. I won't say one, because even CrowdStrike will say there is no one basket, right? But there are um, large baskets where you can put a lot of eggs. And uh, the, the reason I say that is to, to, to continue the AI discussion, you know, AI is only as smart and as capable as the data that you feed it. 
And if you're doing AI in silos, multiple you know, aspects of AI, then you're limiting the scope and therefore the knowledge of the AI. So I, I use an analogy, if you do it in silos, you're creating AI kindergartners. <laughs> right? And our adversaries aren't going to have those limitations. They're going to come at us with AI PhDs. And so we need AI PhDs to combat them. And I think to accomplish that, you, you really need very strong strategic partners that have a lot of telemetry and a lot of capability to incorporate that AI and really have it operating at a level that's going to match our adversaries. And that, that's a game that's, it's, it's an arms race, really. So as you're consolidating, adding here, decreasing there, how are you looking at partners? Are you looking at them differently than you were three or five years ago? And, and how are you making decisions about the vendors you want to work with? Yeah, I would say you know, five, five years ago for sure, we were looking at our partners, I would say tactically. We had a cybersecurity strategy and our partners had tactical, tactical boxes that they checked in that strategy. And now I would say it's absolutely strategic. Um, and we know if we do business with a partner that isn't a strategic partner, that either they're going to get folded into that over time, or you know, we, we probably won't continue to do business with them long term because we really see that consolidation as being necessary for, for our ability to defend our environment and our, our, our data. So I, I, do think, I, you know, I do think that that trend will continue. If you had to sort of stack rank what consolidation gets you, what are the, sort of benefits of it. I mean, we yeah. all talk about simplicity, but I wonder if we could sort of double click on that a little yeah. bit. Yeah, yeah, I'll start with the, the, what I put at the bottom, which is cost, right? And, and like, uh, hopefully my CFO is not watching right now, but <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, it actually, cost is, is a, a favorable thing in that generally, but, but really it's, 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 I think, two things. Um, one is security teams are, are, are over encumbered by integration work. We have all these tools, and to, to make them work effectively, you have to make them work together. So you're doing all this integration work to make tool A work with tool B, which then works with tool C, and are they sharing the right information, and do those integrations work, are you, all the maintenance around that. And uh, most teams struggle to get that right, and that's why I think we see these multi-million dollar investments in cybersecurity, and breaches are still happening. Why? Because somebody missed an integration, and, and the tools weren't talking, and the defense wasn't right. And so it's, it's sort of alchemy in a do-it-yourself world when you're doing it in a just a best of breed approach. That consolidation puts all that integration um, onto our strategic partners who own the products and they know how they need to integrate and they're doing those integrations natively so it ships integrated out of the box. And that overhead and that um, challenge of making the tools work together effectively is probably in my mind the biggest boost. Um, you know, the others are, as I mentioned, you know, just the AI and telemetry, uh, you know, being able to feed all of this into very intelligent detections, very intelligent uh, integration points to disrupt an attack. So something happens here and the attack's trying to move over here. If you're, if you're going from vendor A to vendor B to vendor C in that attack chain, disrupting that can be difficult because you have to have the glue that brings that together. But in a, in a platform ecosystem where all those pieces are part of one platform that works as a singular solution, they can disrupt it here, here, or here. So your batting average for getting things stopped before they hit their payload is, uh, is much higher. And so that's, that, that's, that's that time to, there's no such thing as steady, steady state, I know. What are they building back here? <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> that's, um, <laughs> that's, Every time, yeah. it makes you jump. <laughs> but to that time, I said, there's no steady state, but, but what I mean is full adoption, where you know, you're up and, and running, that you're compressing that time quite mm -hmm. dramatically. We also talk a lot about automation. They're kind of pre the GPT heard around the world, it was like, okay, we're automating as much as we can. I think our eyes have been open in terms of the greater potential. The big thing now is agents, not just co-pilots, but multiple agents. How do you see the headroom in terms of greater automation coming, specifically in the SOC. I think, I think AI assisted configuration management is probably the greatest opportunity yeah. that, that all this, I think, will afford us. Uh, managing the configurations for all these different solutions has been a daunting task. How do you have the right policies? How do you have the right policies at the right point in time as technology's changing? You know, DevOps world, you have production pushes happening, you know, daily even. 
and each production change can change the attack surface and can change the configuration that your security tooling should be doing. So I think that we're beyond the scope of what a human or even a team of humans can really keep up with in terms of that, that configuration management to, to, to say we are in the best security posture state we can be with the tools we have available to us. And so I think AI automation for configuration management is, is really where there's a world of potential and uh, where I'm probably most excited about. And I was telling Rebecca, I was out here last week and, and Larry Ellison talked about two things in his keynotes. He talked about multi-cloud and security. And his, his, his key takeaway was you can't have world-class security without its high degrees of automation. Of course, that favors yeah. them. They've got the automated database, but, but, it, but it extends up the stack. And of course, Oracle, you know, they're very confined in their red stack, so that's nice, all homogeneous, but, mm -hmm. but you know, the world is not homogeneous. <laughs> it, it, it is not, it is not. In, in enterprises, you have legacy systems. Right. You have uh, teams that are higher on the innovation curve and they're embracing new things. And so a wide spectrum of different technologies with different levels of maturity and, and, uh, and so forth. So yeah, it's, that, that, can, that can be pretty daunting at times. But, um, but again, to your point about automation being key to help with that, that's, uh, that, that's certainly true. It's a brave new world. DJ, brave thank new you world. so much for coming on theCUBE again. Oh, it's my pleasure. Really thank you for having it. me. See you. Okay, thank you. I'm Rebecca Knight for Dave Vellante. Stay tuned for more of theCUBE's live coverage of Falcon 2024. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in enterprise tech, tech news and analysis.